All right. Am I on? Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. And of course, thanks, Remy. I'm absolutely honored to be here. So uh, I'm James, and uh, in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to lay out a few ideas I have about uh, the web. Um, and uh, I hope you can read this. Uh, it doesn't look so good from here, but I hope you can read that. Uh, basically, what I want to talk about a little is uh, how I stopped worrying and learned to love open body, closed body, or body slash. Uh, because a couple of years ago, I was working for a company called Sencha, and uh, some of you may be familiar with Sencha. Produced JavaScript frameworks like Sencha Touch, uh, EXTJS, and so forth. And uh, I would do conferences, I'd do meetups, I'd give demos, and this was kind of the standard thing that I would get out at the beginning of these demos to start showing off you know, what we could do with, uh, with the frameworks. And uh, you know, it's a pretty simple index.html. There would be a doc type, open the HTML, open the head, a title, a link to some styling, a link to the library, uh, and then pretty much as soon as I could, get into some inline script. Listen for when the document's all loaded, which by the way doesn't take very long because it's extremely short, and then get on with my job. And uh, this didn't seem like a big deal to me. As programmers, it's got our job to write code that works. It's our job to understand the runtime and its quirks. Um, it's our job to know what will and won't work on given browsers. And it seemed perfectly natural to me that I should be able to do this all in one place in JavaScript with all the expressive power uh, that I needed to do pretty much anything I wanted and, and not really have to worry about the markup piece uh, of the web. Um, now, some of this was a function of the fact that I was working with a pretty rich JavaScript library, uh, and it was a library that was allowing me to work with higher-level web components and, uh, and UI components. Uh, and admittedly, you know, a, fu a, a function of this was also that uh, you know, I was working with a fairly constrained set of browsers. Centra Touch at the time was only working uh, with half-decent uh, WebKit. But I never really thought that this bit was at all controversial. The fact that I didn't have any markup inside my body tag. Um, and I would just kind of throw away comments about, well, you yeah, know, don't worry, the library's going to kick in, and the app itself is going to create, create its own user interface. No big deal. All it needs is that top-level hook to get into the DOM, more or less. Because, of course, that's exactly what an app should do, right? I believe that an application kind of has responsibility for its own uh, user interface, and if you're building the entire application in JavaScript, why not create the, app, the, the user interface in JavaScript too? Literally, this is a bootstrap. That's all it is. Your index.html is just a way of ensuring that the resources you want are going to be available when you want to start up your app. You write something like this, you get something like this. So all of the rich functionality and the swipes and the scrolls and everything else you're getting in this simple sample app, is not coming out of the markup. A little bit of it, of course, is being styled with CSS, but the majority of it is coming out of a JavaScript application backed by, in this case, a library that allows me to do that. So you get that. Admittedly, your DOM looks like this, OK? And that is a sort of a special hell uh, that certainly web designers and, well, probably anyone that works with markup will kind of blanch at. Um, and of course, if you actually view the source, it is literally horrific. Um, but, but so what? Who said view source was a requirement for a web app? You know, in a sense, this is just a stack dump of what your app, or what state your app is in at any given point. Your app created this itself. It does not need to read this, and nor, quite frankly, do you, nor your users. Still, I expect half of you are probably dying when you see this. Um, but look at Gmail. View the source. Look at the DOM. You know, look at the Financial Times mobile app. Look at the source. Look at the DOM. Look at Facebook. Look at the source. Look at the DOM. Actually, they're both pretty scary. But I can assure you, you know, the people that build Facebook know what they're doing. We live in a world where W-Y-S-I-T-M-I-N-W-Y-G-I-T-D, what you see in markup, is not what you get in the DOM. <laughs> it's going to catch on, I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> and that's OK. Because browsers know how to do 
things like this. Create an element programmatically, patch it into the DOM. This is DOM manipulation 101, circa, I don't know, 1998 or something. I am pretty certain that every browser that I ever deal with is going to have no problem doing this. Let's hope so. Um, and at some point, I am perfectly prepared to say I am not interested in browsers that cannot do this. Because, you know, consider the alternative. This is how you might have to do something similar if you have tried to declare that same element in markup up at the top. Here we are. We've had to put an ID on this element. Why? Not because there's anything kind of fundamentally important about that ID, but because that's the way we get a reference back to that element that we declared with angle brackets. Or maybe we have to put a class on it because, oh, there are several of them and we want to be able to get to them. And then in our script, we have to do things like this, document.getElementById, which, by the way, is an awesome way of getting references back into the DOM, very fast, very efficient. But it's kind of annoying to have to do it. If I'd created it myself, I'd have had that reference immediately. Or maybe it's a, a collection of these things, and then I have to use get elements by class name. Oh, this is starting to feel a little less performant. It's actually extremely performant. But oh, wait, 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 doesn't return an array. <gasps> I can't for each through this stuff. Oh, well, uh, I'll have to write my own little loop that goes through each of these elements that were in that uh, markup and patch a reference to them. So I don't know, that just feels like a bit of an overhead to me. Uh, you're <laughs> obviously aware that JavaScript and markup just don't seem to be quite friends here. You know, there is a sort of an impedance mismatch between the DOM API and JavaScript in general. It doesn't quite feel right. Um, but partly you're in this muddle because perhaps some dogma you had that you had to write everything in angle brackets at some point and then later fix it up with curly braces. So you, maybe you're thinking, oh, that's... <laughs> That's irrelevant. I use jQuery, right? I don't need to use any standardized or commoditized DOM APIs. By the power of the dollar sign, you know, I have the opportunity to abstract common code. Well, sure. But here you're still running around inside the DOM trying to find things that you could have had a reference to all along by creating them yourself programmatically. Uh, and incidentally, this probably is, yeah, I don't know. If that big uh, view source made you blanch, this makes me blanch. The fact that I'm in JavaScript trying to get a reference to something and then pasting in inline, or uh, sorry, you know, patching in inline markup, it kind of makes me uh, bristle. Um, separation of concerns, this is not. So I don't know. I agree that there are benefits to abstracting code, and that's why a lot of people use libraries, uh, you know, like jQuery, whatever. But ultimately, you know, for this kind of operation, this perhaps is all you need. You know, create yourself a JavaScript function, which adds an element. It's got a name. It's got a collection of some attributes. You can give it some inner text. Maybe give it a parent. And really, you know, this is possibly all you need to be able to bootstrap your own entire DOM out of JavaScript in a common and reliable way loop through the attributes, set them. If there's any in the text, put it in. If you specified an explicit parent, attach it to that. Otherwise, just write it out into the middle of the DOM. No big deal. But this allows you to write relatively fragrant DOM bootstrap code. You know, here's, here's an example. You know, immediately, I've got a reference to my video element. I've been able to say that it doesn't play automatically. Immediately, I've been able to get a reference to a button that sits in the, immediately beneath it. And immediately, I can bind an event to the video, or to the button, rather, that starts the video. So of course I could have done this with markup, and of course I could have done with, this, with jQuery to go back into the DOM and find these things. But why not just create them programmatically? Kind of feels like what a programmer would do. Programmer would do. And there are, I think, a number of other benefits to this. You know, there's no need, performance-wise, for you to go and post-load, post-render, traverse the DOM looking for stuff. Um, it makes it very, very easy for you to have well-scoped variables, uh, the reference to the DOM elements. You know, they're in your JavaScript scope, whatever, that, whatever you choose that to be, uh, rather than something that's in this kind of global DOM space. Um, it's very, very easy programmatically for you to iterate and recurse and create things uh, in, in more complex ways than the example I just gave. Um, and, you know, ultimately, it, it's no more verbose. In fact, it's less verbose. The same code it would take to put markup 
in angle brackets, and then in JavaScript, patch it up or connect to it. You could have just done it with a, a far smaller amount of JavaScript in the first place. I believe we should try to get angle brackets off the wire. It should be curly brackets on the wire. So um, I think there are a lot of benefits to this. It feels more fragrant. It, you know, sometimes you look at jQuery code that's trying to mash all this stuff together. It just feels a little bit smelly. You know, um, this is a win for a developer, and we can avoid that mismatch, that impedance mismatch between markup and script. And I imagine that the browser itself is working hard constantly to get the markup into a DOM state as quick as it can anyway. So let's swim with the current of the browser. Let's skip the markup step altogether, help the browser out, get to the DOM as fast as possible, and as I said, get curly braces onto the wire. Uh, by the way, it's been pointed out to me that the examples that I used to give, uh, which looked a little bit like this, were even they're far too uh, verbose because obviously browsers are fairly tolerant things this day, uh, these days and uh, turns out you don't actually have to uh, close a lot of the tags so you didn't have to close HTML after all and you didn't have to close head after all um, so you could take those off. Uh, while you're at it, it turns out you don't actually have to open HTML either. Uh, browsers kind of assume that they're looking at HTML. Uh, you don't actually need the body slash part, it turns out. It doesn't really make any difference. Browsers created it if it doesn't exist. Uh, you can actually admit, uh, you, you, sorry, you can't omit the slash title. It's impossible not to close the title tag, but you can add the title itself programmatically, so why not do that? Um, and you might say, well, that, why the hell do you want to do that? Think about it. There are actually quite a lot of times when you want to be able to manipulate programmatically the title anyway, so why not bootstrap it right at the beginning and you've got that reference floating around for you to add unread notification counts or whatever onto your uh, address bar. And of course, the style tag itself, you may as well add that in programmatically, right? You can uh, append simply a link child, uh, say that it's CSS, and the point that you say style.rel equals style sheet, that's when it goes and loads it. Um, it's kind of nice to be able to load styles under programmatic control, actually, if you think about it. There may be cases where you want to uh, switch in one style or another, depending on what you know the browser that you're running on can or cannot do. Um, by the way, someone smarter than me can probably say whether it's quicker to pull in the style after you've created your DOM or before. I don't actually know. Someone can experiment and find out. Um, and of course, the scripts, the other scripts themselves can also be patched into your application programmatically. Simply create a script, tag, and of course, you can register an event to find out when it's loaded. And Bob's your uncle. And of course, this is how JSONP works anyway, and a whole handful of script loaders. So you know, this, this hopefully isn't too heretical. Um, and look. The script tag, its type defaults to JavaScript anyway, so we can take that out too. And actually, we end up with a bootstrap that looks like this. This is the minimum viable index.html. And uh, the only thing that bugs me about this is that you actually do have to have the closed script bit <laughs> there. Um, it turns out browsers really freak out if they don't have that closed script. You can't even do a singleton script. That has always bugged me. Someone fix that, please. So look, some of you will be nodding. Uh, some of you will be thinking, this is fine. I do this all the time. You know, I'm a JavaScript guy. I live in code. My designers live in CSS. We couldn't really decide who was going to do that scrappy markup stuff anyway. Uh, move on, nothing to see. Um, alternatively, your pulse rate is running at 150 you know, beats per minute. Uh, you're ready to come up on script stage. You're ready to throw things at me. You're ready to hit me uh, and uh, burn me at the stake or something. So, well, look, don't please come up on stage and hit me. Uh, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is be deliberately provocative. That's not really what this talk is about. Um, this, this, this is not a, an exercise in seeing how little markup we can write. Um, it's certainly not about people coming up and violently attacking me. Um, what I'm really trying to illustrate, I guess, is, is, a, is a deeper philosophy here, which is that there is no one true way to do web. Okay? Um, with these absurd examples, I've shown that you can more or less remove anything out of your index.html, uh, and uh, kittens won't die. I mean, you'll be able to do your job just as effectively, if not more effectively. Uh, and John is going to come up after me, and he's going to make the case for the existence and the persistence of markup. And you know, he's going to talk about some 
you know, he's going to talk about separation of concerns. He's going to talk about accessibility, I, I expect. You know, he's going to talk about legacy browsers, progressive enhancement, graceful degradation, and all those things. Uh, and everything he says will be right. I mean, it'll be wise, it'll be relevant, uh, and it'll be very, very important in many, many cases. But maybe not all. In fact, some of those philosophies and concerns, you know, aren't actually strongly typed to how much markup you use anyway. Um, and at the end of the day, look, this is software. It's not religion. Um, and software is remarkably flexible. That's why we love it so much. Uh, I think it's OK to experiment. It's OK to see what we can get away with in the hope that we might discover something that helps move the web on. Uh, and it's important to remember that even if we don't let our own craft evolve, our users' expectations and the web itself will evolve. So y you may want to continue to think of the world as a declarative place, you know, with thin client browsers running websites on large screens with sedentary users in a read-only way, statelessly, uh, in an you know, anonymous environment. Or, you know, maybe you want to think about the web as a purely imperative place with thick clients and web apps and small screens and mobile users and read-write and stateful and social. This is my inner Facebook employee coming out here. Um, and, you know, each and every one of you and each and every one of your users and each and every one of your projects is going to be somewhere, you know, at different points on this, on this spectra. Um, you can choose your own adventure. It's okay. Uh, you know, I'm not here to mandate that you think of the world like this, and I hope no one else is ever going to tell you that you need to think of the world like this. So look, when we really talk about this body slash, um, you know, I'm using it as a, a metaphor. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a totem, it's a badge. It's really a glib personification of the fact that we, as web practitioners, you know, can view the, the, view the web, we can view our medium in many very different ways. And despite the fact that this body tag, this little token, is so absurd, it signifies the challenges that lie ahead for us uh, as the web bifurcates and, and evolves. And I like to think that this is a sign, an emblem that we can use to think about how the web can become a competitive and first-class app platform. Uh, and really, that's what I want this talk to be about. When did the web even start thinking about trying to be a first-class app platform? So this is an interesting question. Um, and really, you know, arguably, the moment one of these existed was the point at which the web got kind of exciting. Um, Exhibit A. Because a medium of academic documents hyperlinked together in the bowels of CERN somewhere does not need a way of declaring a submit button. And yet we got one. And as a result, the early web was peppered with a million CGI bin contact.pl scripts. Um, but immediately, the web was on this path to become a read-write medium. Uh, exhibit B might be this. Now, this might not be so familiar to many of you. <laughs> uh, but this is WML. So this was the, the markup language used for WAP, circa 2000 or so. Um, and it also had forms. However basic these little browsers were, you could submit data. Here we are, entering a telephone number. Look, input masks. Click go. Go to the second page. Shake that little baby out, that little dollar sign. It's not jQuery, by the way. That's a reference to the variable that was set in the earlier form. WAP browsers were stateful. It took another 10 years before the regular desktop browser had any sense of state at all. We've been spoofing state for 15 years with cookies and not thinking twice about it. Why the hell can't the browser keep its own state? Uh, and uh, by the way, this just occurred to me the other day, WAP used to have this awesome concept of multiple cards in one document that you could tab between. I don't know, does that sound like jQuery mobile to you? It certainly does to me. Turns out there were people thinking about this stuff an awfully long time ago. Uh, and that, not even mentioning the fact that WAP had some of the earliest implementations of device APIs, but that's an entirely separate presentation. Um, 
So WAP had a dream of bringing the web to mobile, you know, and it didn't achieve that for many reasons. But you know, the fact that WAP was exhibiting many of these disruptive kind of app-like behaviors, by the way, that's what the A stood for in WAP, um, you know, leads us quite quickly, I think, to exhibit C, which is that you know, we're leaving the desktop age, and, and you know, probably left it already, to be honest. Uh, and a post-PC world appears to be a world of apps, not of websites. Uh, users seem to expect to be able to use apps for one reason or another, and uh, we've missed our chance, arguably, to be that primary runtime environment for running apps for our dear users. Uh, and I believe that the web is going to have to fight to catch up. Otherwise, it's quickly going to get out of its depth. Um, it's got some competition. Um, and at the extreme, this is simply about staying relevant. You know, witness the number of <sighs> superficial debates uh, <laughs> over the last four years about native versus web. Um, incidentally, check out the number of phone gap apps that don't pull and pass markup from the server, uh, all of them. Uh, so the novelty of these wears off very quickly. Um, but I feel that these debates that we have about native versus web are a symptom of something deeper. Um, they're a symptom of the fact that there's a changing of the guard going on, a new world order, arguably. Uh, and there are two very particular and branded assaults on the comfy assumption that the web will always win over pre-compiled binary code. Because we do like to say this, right? We do like to say the web will always win. You know, It's up where with, uh, oh, you can't do such and such because it'll break the web. Um, this, by the way, is not an axiom. It is not actually a logical argument. It's just an opinion. And it could easily turn out not to be true. I'm sure you've seen quotes like this before. This is Mr. Daryl Zanuck of 20th Century Fox, back in the 20th century. And he said, television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. He worked in radio. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that at one point in his career, he said something like, radio will always win. And it's rare that technology rolls in and then rolls straight back out again, like the tide. I don't foresee a world, at least in the next decade or so, uh, which, where, where, where native apps and native runtimes are not very, very strong contenders, if not dominant, in mobile. And we have to accept that. And I think that's just the way technology goes. But the web, of course, does have its place. You know, for many types of apps, just like the radio has, has its place for many types of information and many types of consumption contexts. Um, and I think the more important question is not, you know, stating that the web is going to win. The, the interesting questions that we should be asking are things like this. You know, what can we learn from what is happening to technology in users' hands? You know, how can the web stay relevant and competitive and ultimately, how can we continue to keep the lights on? Because apparently, the mobile web is not where people are making all the money. So I've heard. One thing I've learned is about the web's kind of fundamental architecture. This is a quote that I love. Uh, this is Matt de Burgelis. He is one of the founders of Meteor. Um, incidentally, if I had had more than 40 minutes, I would have definitely have used my surplus time to talk about Meteor. Um, unless what you think I've been saying so far is complete heresy, I think you'll love it. Um, and they do a far better job in software of articulating a lot of this thinking uh, than I can do in 40 minutes of keynote. Um, but his quote is this, the web is wearing out. It's 20 years old, nearly. And uh, it's starting to look a little dated. And what he means, of course, is, is you know, the web's architecture isn't necessarily what contemporary technologists need to use to thrill their users. Uh, you know, you know that technology moves in cycles of 10 to 15 years, and, you know, you go back far enough. You know, we used to have mainframes with thin clients and thick servers. Uh, and then we had workstations with thick clients and thin servers. And then we had the web with thin clients again and thick servers again. And now we're on mobile, and we live in a world where, well, you know, these things are pretty smart. And I don't really know what's happening on the server. I'm not even sure if there is a server. Um, in theory, we don't need to worry too much about the processing power on these things. 
pretty good. There's more silicon on here than we're ever likely to need. Um, and of course, yeah, we can't make any assumptions about that connectivity. We need to be able to create a runtime environment which will work down a mine shaft just as well as it does in uh, <laughs> AT&T in Silicon Valley, which is about the same. But anyway, uh, there's something also in here about user experience. Um, it seems that the closer you can get the CPU and the closer you can get your execution to the user, the better products you're going to build. Um, as witnessed by the success of high performance native apps. So, you know, how can we transition the web to help fulfill this apparent architectural requirement? Um, and again, back to this tag, I feel that this sums up many of those architectural assumptions that we have to overcome. You know, submit. Submit to where? Well, you might say that it's a wonder of the web that I could be submitting it to anywhere. I could be submitting my data, not to some local data structure on the device itself, but oh no, I'm going to submit it to Oregon, or Virginia, or Slough, or somewhere. Um, submit, I mean, it feels like I'm submitting my data for approval. Apparently all this silicon on here is not clever enough to check that the data was what it was supposed to be. You know, it's not clever enough to store it in a structured way. You know, it's not clever enough to synchronize it with some other data source. Uh, you know, to not reflect the changes that are made by some other, someone else and then synchronize it. You know, oh, no, no, apparently I have, to, I have to submit it off to the web. You know, and stop and think about that. You know, how absurd it is that when we submit a form, you know, we send a post request, we wait synchronously, the browser spins, some server on the other side of the world looks at my data, checks it's okay, does some processing, stores it, tells me if I got it wrong, and then sends back the entire user interface again as a document um, that my browser then has to turn into a DOM and then re-renders using a cryptic cookie to kind of fake state, you know, to get any sense of, of you know, submitting data on my local device. This, you know, it's 2012. We should be able to do better than this. Um, and of course, that is so absurd, that idea of having to post and get your entire user interface back every time, that fortunately, someone who had interests on both camps, someone who was trying to build a complicated uh, web app that could also influence browsers, uh, invented, oh, Microsoft XML HTTP, you know, the origins of Ajax. It was so, you know, so obvious that when they were building, in this case, I think it was Outlook, um, and the web version of Outlook, it was so obvious there needed to be a way of asynchronously transmitting data so that at least we could avoid that need to redraw the user interface every time people submitted data. Uh, but while Ajax removes the hilarity of you know, re-rendering the entire page every time, you know, this data manipulation use case, you know, I think really strongly informs us about how the web can evolve. Um, and I think it's probably no surprise that the, it was the web forms 2.0 project that really gave birth to what we now call HTML5. You know, it was forms that kind of drove this thinking around web apps. You know, the more, th the more that users think of our documents as applications, the more we'd better make these forms and this data submission thing work better. Um, and I think it's important to remember this heritage. You know, to me, you know, HTML5, you know, the, the input tags are kind of like no big deal, but, you know, in a sense, it gives you a sense of what that heritage is. Um, and forms along with local storage and DOM manipulation. You know, these are the things that are really at the heart of what we're trying to do when we create rich web applications. So yeah, you might be using local storage to preemptively store and cache stuff from the server or newspaper articles or whatever, but no, you know, I think local storage's big story is about tromboning that ridiculous form submission architecture. I should be allowed to manipulate data on my own device, please store it, validate it, model view controller it. I shouldn't have to go off my device to do those basic things. And by the way, I think that's all far more important than HTML5's sometimes headline feature, semantic markup, uh, which, by the way, I assume kind of falls through most browser parsers switch statements. Um, in fact, I did actually go looking into the WebKit code. It was a little scary, but there almost is a switch statement like this for the tag names that the browser passes through, and pretty much most of them end up in the default clause at the end. Um, so that footer you're very precious about, I'm sorry. Uh, and whilst we're talking about tags, I mean, there's something else I think uh, that, you know, is worth paying attention to. And by the way, you know, if I hadn't spent the rest of my 
surplus time talking about Meteor, I would probably have spent it talking about this. So this is something I think is pretty exciting that's going on right now, uh, and that's web components. Um, these rock just as much. Uh, and as far as I know, web components haven't actually landed in any browsers yet. It still seems like it's being pushed uh, through the W3C in some form. Um, but web components are pretty exciting because web components provide us a way to create our own tags and you know, create shadow DOMs and basically manipulate our own widgets, for want of a better word. Um, and here I am you know, creating a carousel tag that I can then use in code um, progressively enhanced from a div. So you might say, well, wait, wait, James, you've been talking about how we don't use markup and, and you know, here's a load of markup. But with web components, you can still do this. DOM.create element carousel. Programmatically, I've created a carousel, this, this higher level component that I had previously defined in a template. By the way, templating is another thing we expect from a first class app environment. Um, and by the way, you can actually do this, which I think is pretty sweet. And just this syntax alone, this little humble piece of syntax kind of gives me a hint of what we should, uh, of how we should be thinking about this future web. You know, this is a web where we should be able to painlessly instantiate new user interface controls, place them anywhere in our application, bind them to data, and that should all happen on the client side. You know, enjoy the simple luxuries like this that our native brethren take for granted and have you know, native application developers have been taking for granted for 30 years. Um, so stay tuned. I'm quite excited about web components. I mean, I think they're another glimpse of, of what it means to be this, this future first class app platform. So, you know, are we there yet? No, of course not. Um, it's one of those facts of life that the web is constantly evolving and it's not just web components that aren't ready, but a lot of what I think we need to have to think of ourselves as a first class runtime, you know, it's not there. Um, and of course, this is the elephant in the room. So this is Mark on stage at TechCrunch and he says this. <laughs> Uh, when I'm introspective about the last few years, I think the biggest mistake that we, that's Facebook, uh, made as a company was betting too much on HTML5 as opposed to native, because it just wasn't there. Um, you know, I spend a lot of my time doing developer relations stuff. I come to lots of web conferences. <sighs> anyway. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that when Facebook is talking about the way that they use HTML, you know, we're talking about our own app. You know, Facebook's app is not everybody's app. Uh, we have slightly different problems to solve than most other people, I guess. Um, and it's true that when we recently relaunched the Facebook app on iPhone, we moved from a hybrid model to one where there was far more native stuff going on. Uh, pixel for pixel, it's more or less indistinguishable. Um, but far more of the views are rendered you know, on the device natively. Uh, we still fall back to HTML5 for stories that we don't recognize. Um, but the point is it runs twice as quickly because it's native, simply because it's native. If web runtimes had doubled in, doubled in performance, it would have been easier for us to wait for that to happen. As it was, we had to take our destiny into our own hands, train up a development team to build an iOS version of our app. Um, but because it's twice as fast, our users consume twice as much content. That's a good thing. And our app store rating, which you know isn't the metric that really matters ultimately, but it does matter to some people, went from two stars to four stars. Not because we changed any pixels, but simply because we rendered stuff with Objective-C instead of HTML5. So I love the mobile web. Facebook loves the mobile web, and we're committed to helping developers succeed, but you know, ourselves, we're acutely aware of what the challenges are to the extent that we are prepared to dedicate a portion of our building to train a bunch of iOS developers, put them in there, and go and rebuild stuff. Uh, because the runtime that we need is not there yet. We would love to have not had to do this. And by the way, Mark uh, is often taken out of context. So actually, if you get past the TechCrunch headlines and you move on to what he also said, it said, look, it's not that HTML5 is bad. In fact, you know, in the long term, he's very excited about it. Um, and also something I, I like to reiterate is that yeah, we have more people on our mobile web app, our mobile websites, than 
all of our native iOS and Android users combined. Um, and that is statistically very significant, right? I mean, we have 600 million mobile users or something. Um, and our own developer ecosystem, you know, third-party developers, I guess, like yourselves, who are building rich social web applications, you know, that's growing incredibly strongly. Um, so we know that the demand for HTML5 to step up to the plate is there. And we want to help it succeed as much as anyone. Um, so I guess this is just me taking the opportunity to say, look, sorry about the churn. Um, I mean, every technology goes through the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, I don't know where on this curve HTML5 is. I'm pretty sure it's not still going up the left-hand side. I'm pretty sure it's not going up the right-hand side yet. It's probably somewhere on the reality kicking in stage. Um, but that's OK. You know, every technology goes through this. You need to be aware of the fact that you know, there are heightened expectations of what we're able to do with the web. And uh, the reality kicks in, and then we have to work hard to actually make it successful. Get past the glitzy demos. Get on with building businesses. And so, you know, in a sense, what I hope Facebook can do, uh, and what, well, what we can all do as a community, is to try to move our favorite stack along this curve as quickly as possible. Um, that's why, you know, Facebook, we do things like the W3C Core Mob community group, you know, trying to inform browsers as to what they, you know, may need to provide us as developers. Um, we have a test suite called Ringmark where we can find out how they're actually doing. Um, you know, and finally, that's why we work with JavaScript SDKs at Facebook itself, so that, you know, you can get your web apps out there and make money. I mentioned keeping the lights on. Now, ultimately, you know, we're in an economic battle with native platforms. So syntax and everything else that I've been discussing aside, we need to be able to make money. So I think we can get there. You know, the web, as a, web, as a first class app platform, you know, is a dream that we should hang on to. You know, we have an amazing community. You know, we have large companies that are committed to making the web successful in the long haul. But the web's survival is not a right. It's a privilege that we can earn. The web will not always win just because we say so. Um, maybe it is showing its age a little bit, particularly architectural, uh, architecturally. Um, the web is always disrupted. Uh, and I believe it will do so again. I think it can disrupt itself. And I think it can do that in order to survive. Um, it will live on. Uh, it's up to us, I guess, as a community of people who work with these technologies to be open-minded. Free the dogma of what has gone before. Think about what you want to do in the future. And of course, go out and build awesome things. Thank you.